Hi, my name is Alex Diener. You might know me as Themzaltuk. I'm in the unique position of being equal parts Let's Player and game developer, and in this talk I'd like to share some insights that doing both of these things has given me over the years. On screen is a link to my YouTube channel, and to my personal website, and a place where you can play my games, and my contact info. This will all be at the end of the talk, too. For the purpose of this talk, I'm going to define a Let's Play as pre-recorded gameplay video with commentary. These videos are usually split into multiple episodes for the game being played. Live streams are a similar concept, and a lot of the points in this talk will also apply to them, but my primary knowledge is of material recorded ahead of time and uploaded to YouTube. Why should you care about Let's Plays? From a developer's perspective, video can be invaluable for learning how your game is perceived. You can see what catches a player's attention, where they get stuck, and get to hear their thought process if they're good enough at sharing it, and Let's Players usually are. And often, spot things that might not be visible in your own playtesting. A Let's Player brings their own audience, potentially putting your game in front of people who haven't seen it. These days, it's common for a viewer to get most of their game recommendations from Let's Plays. If you make a good impression, you might make some extra sales. Let's Plays offer an opportunity to interact with your player base. I've often seen the developer show up in my comments section and have productive conversations with other audience members. Puzzle games are sometimes a tricky genre for Let's Players. It takes extra effort to entertain an audience while solving logic problems. The very act of speaking requires a surprising amount of mental effort, which can make it more difficult to work out a puzzle. However, the reverse can also be true. Talking through a problem often helps solve it. Walking through a thought process out loud sometimes makes it easier to spot missed observations or logic errors. If a puzzle is readable enough, the audience has the opportunity to work out the solution ahead of the player. This makes puzzle games especially sensitive to spoilers, so players who want to apply their own solving process to everything may have to be cautious about interacting with their audience. On the other hand, for the right player and the right audience, this could lead to a fun collaborative solving project, where they put their heads together and work out something really tricky. It just depends on the game and the individual situation. Let's Plays have different environmental dynamics than solo play sessions. Let's Players have extra concerns and time constraints to think about. Some games lend themselves better to Let's Playing than others. Let's Plays exist for almost every imaginable game, so if someone really wants to make a video about a game, they'll find a way. But as a developer, there's a lot you can do to help with this process. Many of the suggestions in this talk can be seen not as, as not only assisting Let's Players, but also improving your game for a general audience. So even if you're not specifically optimizing for video, consider doing these things anyway. So with the introduction and setup out of the way, let's get into some specifics, starting with communication. If you were to take just one idea from this talk, I want it to be this one. Let the player see their mouse cursor during gameplay. The cursor is an indispensable tool for talking through ideas, counting out spaces, calling attention to particular spots, and so on. It makes sense to hide the cursor when keyboard or gamepad input is made, but if I'm moving my mouse on purpose, it means I want to see my pointer. A custom cursor themed appropriately for your game is often nice, but just letting the system cursor remain visible is sufficient. Going beyond mouse cursors, a video watching audience wants to understand what inputs are being made by the player. For puzzle games in particular, it's sometimes hard to tell the difference between making a move and undoing a move. I'd suggest having different animations for these two things, and ideally a unique sound effect that goes along with undoing. Now, something more for the player's benefit. It's important when recording to know exactly when progress is saved. Expect your game to be played in multiple short sessions. The player needs to know when it's safe to stop and quit without losing anything they've done. Later in a playthrough, if your game has any kind of secrets, a Let's Player will want to know when they have more to find or if they're done. Let's Plays usually aim to see most of the content available in each game, and spending time trying to find something that might not exist doesn't make great video. Investigating mysteries is good to a point, but an investigation that leads nowhere might get edited out of a video entirely. There's a balance here. Just try to be aware of how long dead-end paths might be, and whether conclusive answers can be found at the end of them. For video length and episode boundary reasons, a Let's Player will want to know if they're starting something that will take a significant amount of time. This isn't always predictable, but little things like difficulty ratings can help with the decisions of whether to continue playing or to leave something and come back to it in a future episode. 
some more minor points. During a Let's Play, the game activity is going to be discussed out loud, so it may be necessary to refer to game elements by name. If the game doesn't provide names of its own, the Let's Player will likely make up their own terminology. Providing the player with the vocabulary to describe your game makes communication much easier. If a game has identifiable characters, when a Let's Player wants to say something about them, they might trip over pronouns if the game doesn't specify genders. Showing them how to refer to each character makes it easier to talk about them. Similarly, if your game has dialogue but no voice acting, some Let's Players may want to read out loud, and potentially give each character a unique voice. To do this, they need to know which character is talking at all times. I'd suggest a nameplate and maybe a small character portrait for text boxes, especially if the speaker is off-screen. This also helps for following what's going on, not just for doing funny voices. A few more points about character dialogue. If a piece of text is not voice acted, it's important to allow the player to read it at their own pace. Some Let's Players like to read everything out loud. Some prefer not to. Sometimes it varies case by case. The commentator might also want to take a moment to speculate about the text. Text that advances automatically is very disruptive to this process and should be avoided if possible. Auto-advancing can also be a problem if it happens too slowly. It's common for text to appear letter by letter, and if you're doing this, make sure it happens quickly enough that it keeps up with the player's natural reading speed. Even better if they can press a button to immediately make it finish appearing. A related hazard is accidentally skipping an entire text box before getting the chance to read it. For example, I've seen platform games where text can appear in the middle of the action and the jump button dismisses it, causing frequent accidental text skips. Being able to scroll back through already seen text is great for accessibility, both in cases of accidental skipping and for reviewing things previously read. Let's move on to more general readability concerns. The output of a recording session is a fixed size video file. A Let's Player will usually want to fill a 1920x1080 video frame, so it's ideal if your game can fit exactly within this size. There are other common resolutions and aspect ratios, but there are reasons to use specific ones. When a video is uploaded to YouTube, it needs to meet size and format requirements in order to be presented at the highest quality. A video at something other than one of the YouTube-approved sizes may get downscaled to 480p at 30 frames per second. So Let's Players usually try to avoid this, even if it means rescaling the game footage. If your game runs at an unconventional size, be aware that it's not likely to be presented at that size when on video. Since video data is very large, it's necessary to apply lossy compression algorithms to it, usually H.264 or something similar. Because of this, the footage you see will have been run through a filter of sorts, and certain details might not survive the transition. Anything particularly small or low contrast is at risk. Visually noisy scenes can also be a problem. Random static is the most data-intensive thing to encode, and some patterns that show up in games look a lot like random static. Aggressive rain effects are a common one, and certain types of visual filters might not look as good on video as they do in-game. Generally speaking, video quality is proportional to how much of the screen is moving at a time, and too much can turn the whole thing into a blurry mess. Beyond the technical aspects, there are also layout considerations. Some players will include a video of their face on top of the game screen, often in the lower left or lower right corner. If it's compatible with your game's layout, consider having a safe corner where relatively few gameplay details would be covered up by this. Also, the very bottom of the screen is a bad place for text or other things that need to be clearly seen, because playback controls may cover that part of the video. Controls usually disappear while the video is playing, but when paused, it might be impossible to see something if it's too far down. Going back to video compression, there's something I wanted to show in detail. Certain color combinations can be problematic for compressed videos. On the left is an uncompressed test image. On the right is that same image run through the video encoder I personally use. This example is scaled up to double size after compression. Notice how pure red or blue text on a black background becomes much less legible, as does green text on a white background. I only have a rudimentary understanding of why this happens, but from what I know, H.264 encodes color information at half the resolution that it uses for luminance data, so anything that doesn't have a strong brightness contrast might turn out really muddy in the resulting video. 
I'm showing this example specifically because small red text is somewhat common, and orange is a reasonably safe alternative. This might get better in the future as video codecs improve, but since H.264 is still in widespread use, I think it's a good idea to be aware of this. Hopefully this is visible, since there's also a video encoding step between where I am and how you're seeing this talk. Either way, I'd suggest making a video recording of your own game and paying attention to small details and text to make sure they come through clearly. Moving on to more technical matters. OBS, which stands for Open Broadcaster Software, is a free screen recording program that, as far as I know, the vast majority of Let's Players use for recording. It's pretty user-friendly and freely available, so I'd recommend trying it out on your own computer to see how your game behaves when it's captured by OBS. Common game engines will be pretty well behaved, but if you're doing something more unusual, it might take extra effort to get it to play nice with video capture. Ideally, you'll want to render your entire game to a single, fixed-size, hardware-accelerated graphics context, whether that's OpenGL, DirectX, Vulkan, Metal, or some equivalent. Changing resolution or window size can be a problem for recording. Players expect everything to stay in the same place for the whole play session once recording starts. Personally, I strongly prefer to play in full screen mode, but I know Let's Players who strongly prefer to play in a window, so offering both options is ideal. If I'm playing in a window, I don't want to have to mess with its position or size every time I launch the game, so ideally it should remember how I configured it and start the same way the next time. As a side note, this makes games that are exclusive to a web browser especially challenging to record because my browser window isn't always at the same size, position, or zoom level. Offering a downloadable version of a web browser game makes it much more accessible for video recording. Another small point, if you're using pixel art, an option to force integer multiple scaling can help your game look better on video. I'd also recommend choosing a base canvas size that cleanly scales to 1920x1080. For example, 640x360 scales perfectly to 720p, 1080p, and 1440p sizes. Now let's get even more technical. This slide is for the graphics programmers here. If your game doesn't use a low-level graphics API directly, you might not need to concern yourself with this stuff. But if you are, be aware that OBS tends to capture one frame behind what you see on the screen. If you hold on a still frame for some time without doing a buffer swap, what gets shown on video might actually be the previous frame that was rendered. For an example of why this matters, when I did a Let's Play of Legend of Grimrock 2, there was a hotkey I used to load my last save, which instantly switched from the game screen to a loading screen, and then it took some time before loading completed and the next frame was drawn. What this meant was that although I would always see the loading screen on my own monitor, half the time the video would instead be showing a freeze frame of the gameplay just before the loading screen appeared. Speaking of buffer swaps, when OBS is initially hooking onto the graphics context, it has trouble making the connection if no continuous buffer swaps are happening. This can be a problem if, for example, the game's main menu seen at startup is a static screen with nothing moving. A Let's Player will want to make sure the capture software is connected before they start talking, and this is usually done at program start time. Again, I'd recommend trying your game with OBS to see how it behaves. One more little thing I want to mention. I ran into an issue specific to Windows OpenGL, where my game would crash on exit if OBS had ever been hooked onto it. As it turns out, the graphics context needed to be explicitly deleted at the end of execution. I used an at exit handler to call WGL delete context, and the crash stopped happening. This was years ago, and I figured it might have been a bug in OBS that had since been fixed, but I tried disabling my at exit handler just the other day, and the crash actually still happens. Explicitly freeing resources on program exit is usually a waste of time since the operating system reclaims them more efficiently than anything your code can do, but WGL contexts that have been hooked by OBS are a specific exception to that. Moving on to other matters, let's talk about audio. Since the player is going to be talking while playing, you should expect your game audio to be much quieter in the final mix than the player's voice. They need to make room to be heard without getting drowned out by the game. One possible exception to this is voice acting. It may be desirable for voice audio to be somewhere around the volume of the commentator's own voice. Something I've seen a lot is when the game's own audio mixing makes voices too quiet by default. For example, when I'm playing Drod, I have to turn the music and sound effects way down and set voice audio volume at maximum in order to hear speech clearly. If sudden interjections can happen during the game, expect that the player might be in mid-sentence when this happens. Sudden voice clips or sound effects are likely to be talked over. 
Some kind of noticeable signal before this happens, like an empty text box coming up and waiting for a brief moment, can help avoid the game and the player talking over each other. Make sure your soundscape is evenly balanced. Ideally, the player should be able to calibrate their audio settings before starting gameplay and not later encounter much louder or quieter sounds that make it necessary to readjust in the middle of the game. Usually it's not a problem, but a few games I've played have been so chatty that I've had trouble getting a word in edgewise. If your game has a lot of voice clips, just be aware that this can get in the way of a commentator's ability to share their own thoughts. Sometimes it's necessary for the player to talk over top of the game's voice acting, but it's never ideal when it has to happen. On another topic, in the modern age, a hazard of putting videos on the internet is the threat of copyright holders imposing restrictions based on something heard in the middle of the video. If you have any non-original music in your game that might run afoul of copyright claims, I'd recommend giving the player a clear warning about this and providing an option to disable copyrighted music during gameplay. Thumbnails. Every video on YouTube comes with a thumbnail image. This is the public face of the video and will be seen by far more people than the number who click through and watch the full video. The uploader usually has full control of what their thumbnails look like, though new YouTube accounts are sometimes restricted to automatically generated choices. For video game thumbnails, you might see a fully custom image or an unaltered video frame from the episode or anything in between. Personally, I prefer to use unaltered video frames for my own thumbnails. For puzzle games, it's sometimes hard to choose one that doesn't reveal too much. Occasionally, I've found it necessary to blur out details that I feel shouldn't be made too visible, especially to someone who hasn't played the game yet. There's a tension between showing too much and too little. I look for something that evokes curiosity about what happens in the episode. Visually striking things are often the most revealing, which makes this a difficult process. Puzzle games sometimes have the opposite problem. Important things are in the small details, and every thumbnail for a video series ends up looking about the same. I enjoy it when different sections of a game have distinct color palettes or other large details that show up clearly on a thumbnail, showing progression over the course of the video series. Pacing. Depending on the player, an episode of a Let's Play might average 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, or some other length. Those are the most common target times I see. A Let's Player wants their play sessions to divide cleanly into chunks of their preferred length. Repetitive tasks like traversing the same terrain multiple times often don't make good video, and the player might opt to skip ahead to when they reach their destination. The tedium of repetitive tasks is amplified because on top of the time spent in-game, it's extra work editing the video afterward. Keeping downtime to a minimum makes the player's experience more pleasant and allows videos to be edited more lightly, thereby more accurately representing your game's overall experience. Any kind of setback or punishment is felt more harshly while recording or streaming because there's external time pressure on top of what's happening in-game. Players like to finish what they've started in the same episode if possible, and when punished with a setback, this can mean significantly more recording time than what goes into the final video. Speaking about puzzle games in particular, it feels bad to end an episode in the middle of solving a puzzle. I've played plenty of puzzle games that require longer solving sessions than I can comfortably fit into a normal episode, and sometimes it's worth it. But my preference is always to be able to stop after around half an hour of play with the knowledge that I've made appreciable progress. Missable things. Sometimes things go wrong that make it necessary to throw away an entire video and start over. When this happens, the best that can be made of a bad situation is to restore the game to how things were at the beginning of the recording session. Ideally, this would return all progress to an earlier state, including meta-progression like unlocks and achievements. Being able to easily back up save data is a good start. Better if it happens effortlessly or automatically. In games with multiple save slots, you'll often see Let's Players choosing to save to a different slot each session. If saves always ratchet forward, and an earlier state can't be restored easily, it makes video recording feel a whole lot riskier. A different kind of missable is things that happen too quickly after program startup. Even on the most aggressive settings, OBS takes a, at least a few seconds to start capturing its startup, so the very first thing your game shows might not be video capturable. It's helpful to give the player a safe staging area where they can set up recording before anything important happens. Intro cinematics are a common offender. If you have one of these, I'd suggest either not playing it as the first thing your game does on startup, or at the very least, providing a way to watch it again somewhere in your main menu. 
The player might have specific hotkeys they press to start, stop, or otherwise control their recording setup. Personally, I use numpad asterisk, minus, and zero for various recording controls, but I've heard of keys as common as the tab key being used for this. Ideally, it should be easy for the player to find hotkeys that can be freely used without side effects in the game. Playing a system beep counts as a side effect. Make sure pressing an unrecognized key doesn't do that. One more thing I'd like to advocate is to provide an optional, effortless way to unlock everything in your game. This doesn't have to be a compromise. Players who want your prescribed experience won't use this option, but players who have already completed the game will appreciate it in case their save file has gone missing or they're done playing the game and just want to see if they missed anything extra. This is definitely not applicable to every game, but I'd encourage you to think about whether it can apply to yours. Staying in bounds. Sometimes a game's expected experience involves taking notes. If there's a way you can provide in-game note-taking facilities, Let's Players will make good use of them. For example, Legend of Grimrock allows the player to click any map tile and write arbitrary text on it, and then refer back to those locations and see what was written. If a Let's Player has to resort to writing things on paper or in a separate text document, it takes extra effort to show those things on video. Similarly, if the player might want to take a screenshot and refer to it later, you can help them by providing a way to do this without leaving the game. For example, Quern Undying Thoughts has a diegetic way to do this by giving the character a notebook item and a hotkey to draw a sketch in the notebook, which can be reviewed later at any time. If a Let's Player has to resort to saving image files outside the game, it takes extra effort to show those on video. This is rare, but once in a while a game might do something unconventional by putting important information outside the normal play area, like the window title or menu bar. If the expectation is clearly set up front that the entire screen needs to be captured, this sort of thing might get recorded, but normally only the content area will be visible, and anything beyond it takes extra effort to show on video. Overlays like Steam achievements may or may not get captured depending on the Let's Player's recording settings and personal preferences. If your game has achievements and earning them is an important part of the game, I'd recommend showing an in-game display in addition to letting Steam do it. This has several benefits. It's repeatable on replays, it ensures that the achievement is captured on video, and it makes the achievement feel more at home in your game. A Steam pop-up showing a second copy of the achievement doesn't really get in the way of anything. One last thing, privacy. A Let's Player shows the world what they see, so it's worth thinking about whether you're showing them anything that shouldn't be seen by the world. There's obvious stuff like IP addresses, account names, and passwords, but times and dates can actually be sensitive information too. A personal example. Sometime last year, I made a change from recording everything the day before it was published to recording it significantly in advance, and at the time I wasn't ready to disclose this to my audience. However, one of the games I was playing showed the current date when a save file was created, revealing this information before I was prepared to talk about it. I could have blurred it or cut it out of the video, but that would still call attention to it. Some games provide a streamer mode setting to prevent sensitive information from appearing on screen, and I'd advocate for hiding times and dates when in this mode. Earlier, I mentioned that OBS provides the option to capture the player's entire screen. Since your game might be captured this way, quitting abruptly or exiting full screen mode or messing with the window size or position risks revealing the player's desktop and whatever they have open. This is a less serious issue for pre-recorded video than for streaming, but it can still introduce extra video editing work that needs to be done. That's it. That's all I had. Here's my contact information again. I hope you got something useful out of this talk. Remember, if you have just one takeaway, I want it to be to not hide the mouse cursor during gameplay so that I can point at the things that I'm talking about. Thanks for listening!